Hey everyone, welcome to my personal prominent segment with the legendary five-time All-Pro Super Bowl champion, Andre Risen. He had an amazing football career and is known to be the greatest wide receiver of all time. Today we will talk about how the NFL has changed, how he's changed, and something new for Andre. Now he has a biopic in production called Foolishly in Love, The Andre Risen Story. The movie is set to release in the spring of 2019 with character portrayals of many people including Tupac Shakur, Suge Knight, Deion Sanders, Too Short, Lisa Lopez, and more. The world will now be able to learn the truth behind the rumors as Andre's story is told from his eyes. Andre Risen, it's so nice to have you on today. Hey, how you doing? Doing good. Good, good, good. Well, first and foremost, Andre, congratulations on all of your success. Truly, you're a football legend. Well, yeah, thank you. You know, it, it, it sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but before, but Andre, before we start talking about anything related to your incredible biopic that you're doing, I want to talk to you a little bit about your amazing history with football. Um, so can you take us back in history a little bit, as, as young as you were, um, how did you feel when um, you learned or in that moment when you found out that you got traded from the Indianapolis Colts to the Atlanta Falcons? Um, let me see. Let me dig the archives. <laughs> uh, I had really never been to the South, so I was kind of, I was kind of upset because I had just made the all NFL rookie team, all that stuff. And so I didn't understand why I was traded, but I was traded for the number one pick overall. And so that was kind of, I guess you would say a pat on the back. You know, if you get traded for the number one pick overall, that means you must be pretty, pretty, you know, decent. And, um, the first day I ever, ever came to Atlanta, me and my mom came down and, um, Got picked up and came down and, uh, went headed out to Swanee and career took off right after that. I mean, it just happened so fast and, um, just took a, took a, a liking to the city and the people of the city and football really was second nature at that point. But, um, I was for sure happy when, you know, we got the dome and, we moved inside because I'm a real original Falcon. We played in Florida County Stadium, and then we went from Florida County to the Georgia Dome. And um, you know, so that was that was sweet being a part, you know, part of that move. And um, I don't know, it just was a lot of fun. You know, football, like I said, football was second nature uh, to me at that point because it was like you know, you dream of making it to the pros when you're a kid and if that's your dream, you know, making it to the highest level. And here I was on the highest platform playing in a city of like Atlanta, you know, was was awesome. Right, right. Because you're originally from Flint, Michigan and you went, you know, throughout your high school and everything and then you got to into the NFL. So I bet you that was a big shift from being in Flint than going all the way over to Indianapolis and then finally to Atlanta. Yeah, you know, uh like I said, I'm from up north, and so it's different, you know, it's different uh, language, different speech, and different culture being from up north than it is down south. But the people in the south, you know, they welcomed me with open arms and made it adjustment easy for me and um, gained a lot of friends and, and, and created a lot of friendships that still last today. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You know, thinking about football, too, along those lines, you know, football is an amazing sport. It's a lot of fun, and many people all over the world watch it, but it's also dangerous. So I know that you've done a lot of advocating for players who have been hurt in the game, even yourself. And so how do you personally deal, or how did you personally deal with the pain that was associated with being injured, or more especially, like, the concussions that you obtained? Um. You know, when you play as long as I play, you're going to hurt, especially at my size. I'm not a big guy. So, you know, my from me, the ankles, the broke fingers, all my fingers on one hand been broke, you know, to the concussions, to, you know, bone spurs and all kind of stuff. So it comes with the territory. You learn that at an early age. You know, that's why they tell you everybody can't play football. 
You know, right. You know, um, I've seen a lot of great athletes not play football because of the physicality of, you know, they can run, they can jump, you know, but they weren't going to play no football. <laughs> <laughs> right, football, right. football is only for the ones that play. You got to love football to play football. Yeah, I would, I would think so. So how, uh, speaking of that thing, like loving football, how did you even become interested in football? I mean, what was that turning point for you growing up as a kid to make you want to play football in the first place? Watching TV and watching the superstars do their thing, you know, the, the Walter Paytons and Lynn Swans, you know, watching people uh, play on Sundays with my granddad, just watching TV and hearing the commentators talk. And as a kid, you always want to hear certain commentators say your name. And that's what made me strive for it. And um, it was a way to get up out of the ghetto, too. Right. Okay. It was a way to, you know, further my education, going to college and then from college to the pros. Um, it was just a learn. It was a learning experience, really, for me and my whole family. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I can I can understand what you're saying about how growing up you wanted to kind of emulate what those players were doing, you know, sitting there as a kid watching and, and wanting to hear your own name. How did that whole, how did the Bad Moon Rising come about? How did you get that name? Bad Moon? Yeah. Um, how did you get that name? <laughs> Bad Moon came from uh, Chris Berman. <clears throat> Chris, Chris Berman was uh, on ESPN, um, commentating games and whatnot, and all of a sudden one day it just popped up and he just said, bad moon, and it just stuck, you know, it stuck. And, uh, <clears throat> and then it went from there, it went to bad moon, and, like, you know, you got to, it, it's a rule, you can't just give yourself a nickname. Somebody has to give you it. You got to earn it, so. Uh, okay. you know, I'm not going to go into details how I earned it. <laughs> <laughs> we just go take it, we just go take it as is, like, bad moon, you know. Like bad moon, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, well, thank you for sharing that little bit of information then about how you got the name. Because I understand uh, you can't, you're not giving your yourself a nickname. <laughs> come about. It's in the movie. That's, not, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's in the movie. But well, you, good. It's in the movie. I know, it's right? In the movie. Mm -hmm. um, numbers, your numbers are amazing. But, you know, you yet to get to do for it. And although you definitely proven, you know, that you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. So what is your personal take on why it hasn't happened for you yet? You know what? I don't get into it uh, as far as the Hall of Fame thing is concerned. I know I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. And um, when, I when, I re when I retired, I was in the top ten all time in every category. So you can only do what you do when, when it's your time. So, um I don't, I don't know why, but I never got mad because I watched Art Monk. Uh, who was, who was quiet. He was all pro. He had all, he was all, he was all pro. He was everything. And, um, he led the league in touchdowns and catches and all this stuff. And they would never put him in the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame for a long time. And so I said, well, if a guy of that character can't get in the Hall of Fame, I was like, wow. And no sense either barking. If it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't, you know? That's true. That's true. If that reminds me of what you're saying, reminds me of my favorite quote from Victor Hugo that says, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. You know, mm -hmm. when the time has come, when it's finally there, it's there, you know, whether it happened, you know, last year, 10 years from now, 20 years ago, you know, when that time comes, nothing can stop it from coming. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that piece of information. So now about the Andre Rising story. This is the most anticipated celebrity athlete movie since O.J. Simpson, and it's been a long time coming. So can you kind of tell us how long it's been in the works? Uh, how long we've been? We've been in. It's been in work. It's been in work about twenty years. I say twenty years. You know, you know how something something hot happens and. Everybody's like, you should do a movie, you should do a movie, or you should write a book, you should do a movie, you should write a book. They've been saying that for 25 years. <laughs> so we just, we just kept doing hot stuff, you know, keeping it on the skillet. And uh, we just thought it was a good time. Everybody was in a good place. 
everybody's playing a part and role in it. Uh, everybody's a significant part and role in it, and that's what I wanted to make sure, too, that I was doing it with the right people, with the right, right. intent. Yeah, that's definitely an important uh, factor, you know, making sure you have the right people in place to to make things come out the way that they're supposed to and make it come out properly anyway, the way mm-hmm. that it should be told. So so the casting is tomorrow. You guys are speaking characters to depict yourself, of course. Yeah, um, okay, to do casting is tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're looking for uh, somebody to play, play your, your role, of course, and Lisa mm-hmm. Lisa Lopez and Tupac. Shagnite mm-hmm. and Dion Sanders. So speaking of Dion as one of the characters you're casting, let's go back in history. Let's say what is it? Twenty four years ago, about Sunday, October sixteenth, nineteen ninety four, Georgia Dome. Dion was with the San Francisco Forty Nine ers. You're with the Atlanta Falcons. You guys had a huge fallout on the field. What is your relationship like? Or what was your relationship like up until that moment, after that moment, and even right now? Oh, this is my guy, you know. Uh, brother squabble, you know. That's all that was, was competition, and, you know, we we, we went at it. And um, after the game, we said we was going to take care of each other and, and all the way up to this point, you know. Uh, he was always a good, good friend of mine and a great teammate. So um, that's that's what that's what bosses do, though. That's right. That's right. You guys have your your ups and your downs, and then it is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh huh. But no, we 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 we, we groovy. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I mean, I'm glad. Uh-huh. That you know, I, like I said, I can't I can't wait for the movie to come out, and, and everybody is participating in this movie. So, in your opinion, Andre, what would you say? is the most important moment that needs to be shared in the upcoming biopic? Um, what would be the most important moment? Right. And talk about the film? Yeah, talking about the film. Like, what do you think would be, I mean, if, if something were, you know how you're um, doing movie production, some things have to be omitted. So let's say there's something that, uh, I would probably say most important is, is, is the finale. Okay. okay. You know, to show people how, how, how we've come full circle. Right. You know, and the yeah. finished product, the finished product of this, of this man. You know, 25 years ago, I was a totally different person, you know. That's right. People, I think, need to understand. You made an important point by saying that, you know, 25 years ago, you were a different person. You know, people that knew you 25 years ago, um, they could, you know, of course, they know you, but they may not know you now. And, you know, I tell right. people that a lot of times, too. You know, the person you were five years ago um, could have been great. You know, you could have been the best person in the world. Or things could have been bad for you. But just because, you know, somebody knew you at one point in time doesn't mean that they know you now. Right, right. And um, you know, we just we just live in life. You never know what's ahead of you. So you just take your time, take one step at a time and ask the Lord to guide you the right way. That's all you can do, you know? And health yeah. health is health is everything. Definitely, definitely. And um I'm thinking back about just life in general and how things were twenty five years ago compared to now. Um, you know, things change. Time changes and people change. So anyone right now with any sense can clearly see, you know, that the incidents of police brutality and injustices among, you know, black Americans is skyrocketing. And back in 2016, when Colin Kaepernick first set out during the National Anthem up through now, like different players doing that, what are your thoughts concerning the NFL players taking a knee? I mean, any time you stand for a great cause. I mean, that 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 deserves, you know, a nod. But um, I think it got blown out of proportion to a certain extent because there were guys years before been making protests, whether it was quiet, whether it was loud, whether it was abrupt. There have been many guys to protest. Uh, 
you know, different ways about different subject, subjects, whether it was police brutality, whether it was um, domestic violence, you know, um, it's always been stood for as far as, like, athletes, you know, you have a certain group of athletes that won't touch politics or won't touch uh, things of that nature, but then you got your crew that will, and it's all about who who has the uh, the wits to do it, you know, because there is a backlash to it when you're a company company man, right? You know, because you don't control you don't control your destiny when you talk about your job and you do something like that, and you know the owner of your team say, hey, if you don't stand for the national anthem, I'm gonna cut you. I'm I'm firing you. I'm a release and you're gone, you know. Well, you got to, you know, you think twice because you're putting food on the table for your kids. You're putting food on the table for you, your wife, your spouse. So you got to think about it. And some people don't, some people ain't ready to do that, you know. Right. You know, right. we had a million, we had a million man march. And, you know, we still got black kids killing black kids. We got to stop that first. And, Plus the police brutality, for sure. But we got to stop killing each other. Absolutely. And you brought up a really good point about that, too. You know, you have um, I mean, different people <clears throat> have, uh, you know, different outlooks on life in general. Plus, like you said, you know, people are trying to do the best that they can, you know, be, as a job, um, being a professional af- athlete. You're putting food on the table, like you said. You know, you're providing for your family. So that's going to be a big part of a decision to either do something that's going to be detrimental to your career or um, to think otherwise. So I'm glad that you shared that that piece of information. So what is some of your biggest advice, though, for these young athletes? I know you, were work, you do a lot of work with, you know, youngsters getting into, you know, with football and things like that. So what is uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice that you can give someone who wants a career with the NFL? Uh, one that one that wants to get in, um, it's hard, and it's, it's uh, a lot of luck. But you got to press the luck, though. You know, you gotta you gotta believe in yourself and and, and believe in what you do is it, right for what you're trying to do. You know, and, uh, everybody can go in the store and buy that same suit, but when we walk out, it's still gonna be different people. You know, but who's going to walk out and be the most confident in that suit and tie and wear it the best? You know, yeah. that's the trick because it's, lot of, lot of, it's a lot of kids across the country do the same thing as you do. So everybody's trying to get in this one little door, you know, yeah. and, all y- and all y'all got the same suit on, the football suit, you know. And it comes down to presentation, your first impression. You know, and, um, being loyal, being humble, treat people how you want to be treated, and you know you go further that way. And uh, everything's not promised to you, so when you think you might deserve something. You know, a lot of times you don't get it, but you can't stop in life. You can't stop in life. So my my biggest thing is if you're in position to get to the National Football League or anything for that matter, you got to make sure you get your degree. Because you gotta have something to fall back on just in case it don't happen. And more than likely, it's not gonna happen. That's just how tough it is to make it. Yeah, and I think that it's an important message that you're, you're talking about right now. Um, and saying that, you know, you can be the most talented player in the world and, and still not get picked up because you just might be getting overlooked for some reason. Maybe it's your personality, maybe it's your, it could be anything. It could be just there's just so many people yeah. who are like you. What, what's making you uh, stand apart? What's making you different? And it's kind of kind of it's like you said, a luck, the luck of a draw. You know, you don't have um, everybody cannot come through the same door. No, we come from different backgrounds, come from different, you know, livelihoods. And, you know, um, my thing is to the ones that's playing, the current ones, and, and the ones in high school and, and, and whatnot, is uh is keep your hands and keep your hands to yourself, you know. Um, no man should put his hands on a woman 
and especially as strong as we are and, and as violent as we strike, there's no way these kids are supposed to be, these black kids are supposed to be white. It don't matter, black, white, but it, it pisses me off when I continue to see black professional athletes caught up in domestic violence cases and losing right. their jobs and losing their, you know, and just, just putting themselves in that predicament. I mean, I, I mean, you can't you can't let her get you that upset. You can't let them get you that upset. You can't let it get you that upset where you put your hands on a woman. You know, and um, at some point in time, some point in time, we got to stop, which is hopefully ASAP because it, it puts a dark mark on the black athlete, the black male athlete. You know, and um, that I hate that. Right, right. And it's good that you shared that, you know, because there's nothing more important than being able to have some type of self control. Mm -hmm. Self control is is a, a big factor in a lot of things that we do as human beings every day in our life. You know, if if people no. lack that control, then that's when you he, you ha, you hear about these stories. That's when you hear about no. um, a bunch of different things happening. Mm. Well, if you if you hit a woman, you hit your mom. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you can't be around me. That's right. That's right. You know. I'm so. glad to share that too. So when okay, so when foolishly in love, the Andre Rising story gets released, when it finally comes out and everybody's able to see it, what message do you expect viewers to take away from it when they walk out of the movie? What what message do you want them to have? What mind? message? Uh yeah. for the move for the movie. Um, you can be you can you can be somebody. And you can survive the hurdles of life. You know, everything ain't gonna be rosy. Everything ain't gonna be hunky dory. Ain't, you know, everything ain't gonna, ain't gonna be Christmas. You know, it's gonna be some times in there where, you know, it, it, it's dark. You know, it's gonna be some lonely times in there. It's gonna be some hurtful times in there. And you gotta know how to endure all that. And then at the end, and then the finale, you know, be the best person you can be. That's right. That's true. Yeah. So, will you be making a cameo in your your movie? Um. Uh, let me see. Am I making a cameo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see who I can play. Yeah, I'm the anchor man. I'm Dan Rather, CBS Sports. <laughs> oh man. I don't know. I'm, I might make a cameo. I might make a cameo. <laughs> Well, I know you guys are going to have a great time uh, casting for this movie. You got a lot of great parts, and a lot of people yeah. who I know are going to come out and you know help support. Can um, the people of Atlanta do anything to help support this movie? Oh, uh, they've been supportive, so supportive. Today is media media roll day, and you know I've done media. We've done media since six o'clock this morning, seven o'clock this morning. We've been doing media, and it's all 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 Atlanta publications, and so. Um, They've been they've been great to us. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, Andre Ryzen, it has been a real pleasure speaking with you today about your amazing career and this highly anticipated movie in the works. Everybody is looking you know forward to it, and I wish you nothing but continued success in all you do. And I hope to see you at the premiere. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And thank you so much. You are welcome. Take care now. <laughs> <laughs>